Thanks, Dr. Patrick. So let's talk about FAI. That was a great review of the radiology. One of the things, when a new disease process gets invented, hardly was it, it just invented, but it just becomes more popular, everything is FAI. And my point of this slide that not everything is FAI. It's, it's certainly uh, much more common than we think, but there are other hip disorders that you have to look for that are defined in intraarticular hip processes. But what is FAI? We know impingement. We know head-neck ratio. Uh, you know, I have countless arguments with my father about impingement about five years ago, uh, but he understands impingement and everyone understands impingement and it has relevance in both the native hip, the total hip, and certainly in the resurfaced hip. Uh, and there's uh, two broad types. There's a cam lesion, which is on the femur, and there's a pincer lesion, which is on the acetabulum. How do you define these? Well, you want to have people, young males with groin pain are usually very common. The most important physical exam finding is the impingement test, which is flexion internal rotation, where you get that cam lesion or that pincer lesion to engage and crush the labrum. Uh, we had an extensive talk about all the different imaging. A, a well-done x-ray is the most important thing. CAT scan and MRI are also very critical. The most important thing about an x-ray is to make sure the x-ray is centered. The most common reason for me of a diagnosing of a crossover sign is actually a poorly done x-ray. So make sure your x-ray is centered in both the coronal and sagittal planes. This is an example of a large cam lesion. On a done view, you can see that lack of femoral offset. Here's that crossover sign that Dr. Vale was talking about. You can see the anterior and posterior walls are crossing, and you can also see the posterior ischial spine. This is a sign also of a potentially retroverted acetabular socket, which has implications in total hip in terms of uh, controlling for your antiversion. Here again is an example of a CAT scan. Also, MRI, very critical. Let's kind of breeze through this to get to the crux of the talk, which is management. Uh, the classic approach to this was profess uh, espoused by Professor Gons, which is an open surgical dislocation. This was based on understanding the anatomy of the femoral circumflex artery and really uh, allowing us a surgical window that does not violate this uh, blood supply to the femoral head. What is a surgical dislocation? Well, it's a trochanteric osteotomy preserving the blood supply and a Z capsulotomy in an anterior hip dislocation. Uh, this is then how you, then you can then decompress the cam lesion anteriorly with either a burr or an osteotome. And that's an example of what it looks like. This is before, this is after. Same idea you can do on the acetabulum. Uh, a common technique is to use an acetabular reamer, put the reamer in, outline where there's excess of bone, trim that bone, and then refix the labrum. Here's an example of after trimming the labr uh, uh, detaching the labrum, trimming down the bone, and then reattaching, labral refixation versus labral repair. There's also now arthroscopy. I'm an arthroscopist. Because of increase in interest in the hip, because of Professor Gans, because of also new uh, arthroscopic instruments, mostly flexible instruments, there's been an uh, explosion in hip arthroscopy to treat, these arth uh, to treat these in a more minimally invasive fashion. It doesn't require an arthrotomy, it doesn't require trochanteric osteotomy, and you can treat both intra- and extra-articular disorders. This is the setup. You use a basic fracture table and you use fluoroscopy, and you put the hip into traction. Uh, you can use anywhere from two to five portals. Uh, there, there's a big window in the front anterior lateral aspect of the hip where the only thing you have to really worry about is a lateral femoral cutaneous nerve. The good indications for hip arthroscopy presently is a, a large, as a cam lesion that's mostly anterior lateral. Some pincer lesions are also treatable. Also, non-FAI uh, pathologies, PVNS, loose bodies, and a host of other things can be treated arthroscopically. What you want to do is learn how to diagnose the pathology. This is a central compartment, which we saw before, where you can see that chondral delamination. And then you can switch into the peripheral compartment. This is out of traction, and you can see the long cam lesion. This is the vincula, which is the blood supply inferiorly at roughly the 6 o'clock position. This is more of a classic depiction of a pincer lesion where you have less chondral delamination but more labral pathology. This is an example of an extensive labral tear, and this is that same tear that's repaired with a suture. This is one of the techniques. You can pass a spectrum. There's multiple arthroscopic devices you can use to fix a labrum. The labrum, unlike the meniscus, is probably its main role is a suction seal effect, uh, which was espoused by Ferguson uh, with the Swiss group. So this is what you want to do. You want to first treat all the intraarticular pathology. Then you want to treat uh, the, uh, the cam lesion. And to go back to what Dr. Vale says, you just don't treat the labral tear. You ideally want to treat the bony impingement that's causing the labral tear. And this is taking down the the cam lesion here, and also decompressing the pincer lesion here. 
Again, this is in the central compartment or the main portion of the hip. This is in the peripheral compartment or the outside portion of the hip. Once you've done your rim decompression as well as your cam decompression, you then do a dynamic assessment to assess no impingement. And this is kind of what you, what you want your radiographs to, work, to look like. This is a large cam lesion before, roughly the same x-ray, same amount of rotation. You can see clear decompression on both the rim side and the femoral side. What's the results? Well, the open group have shown good short-term results and, and some emerging data also shows comparable arthroscopic results, but still very, very early in this process. The critical point what Dr. Vail is talking about is your degree of arthritis is directly proportionate to your uh, outcomes. So if you are doing carotid uh, joint preserving procedures on arthritic hips, you're doing the wrong operation. The patient says, I don't want a total hip, and you say, no, you need a total hip. You have extensive arthritis. What are the advantages of an open procedure? You get a huge view. You get tremendous access. The labor uh, repair is very easy. Risk of AVN, though, uh, is minimal, but certainly always there. The problem with it is trochanteric nonunion and hardware, as well as a long hospital stay, HO, and SCAR. In terms of an arthroscopic management, it's more minimally invasive. It's a day procedure. You can treat associated abnormalities. The problems with it is that you have a limited view. You can't treat everything very effectively in the sense it's technically difficult and there's a lot of fluoro time. This is just a couple of papers, uh, papers when I was a resident. I actually did with Dr. Padgett and just showing that both from comparing arthroscopic and open techniques that we found comparable results in both the efficacy as well as the safety. This was a blood supply study. So when to do it arthroscopically? Well, as I said, anterior lateral cam lesions are, are very amenable to arthroscopic and, and more milder pincer lesions. When you want to open, when you have a posterior cam lesion, when you want to distalize the trochanter, and when you have extensive pincer disease. Just to review one last thing is that remember to treat the bone. Uh, but be careful if you have dysplasia, if you have excessive valgus, uh, if you have increased femoral aneuversion, then neither of these procedures are the right procedure. Thank you very much.